Cool. We are live and on time this week for our episode of the Workplace Wonderer. Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm in the stride. Some consistency going on with, with the weekly episodes of this show. And what's really cool about this show, if you've never seen it before, is that I get a chance to sit down and speak to experts of basically all things related to workplace wellness, all things related to workplace wellness. So um, anything from leadership tactics to employee support to having difficult conversations to um, understanding discrimination in the workplace. I mean, really anything to do with making workplaces better. I get to sit down and talk to people who are actually living that and studying this and um, working hard to make changes in the workplace. So I'm really excited about having my guest this week. I have Wendy Bundy on here. And uh, this week we're discussing evidence-based work support. And one of the reasons why I'm excited about this one is I do think there's a lot of practices that, out, that are out there um, that are amazing and, and may be very helpful. But I think having work supports that are evidence-based and practices that are evidence-based can really actually help sell the idea of workplace wellness and sell the idea of improving workplace culture and, and employee wellness, all of that. Um, having this evidence and data to back up some of the things that we're doing in the workplace, I think really can help sell it to the leadership team and help people understand that, you know, it's, it is, nothing but beneficial to bring these types of supports in. So Wendy, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And I, I was laughing a little bit when you said uh, having experts on this podcast, because I don't know that I would consider myself an expert. I think I'm still very much in the um, early stages of just figuring out what works for me. So maybe I'm an expert on myself and what's worked, um, but definitely not an expert on the, the broader sense there. Well, you might be selling yourself short. <laughs> But I, you know, it's, uh, that's okay. That's okay. So mm -hmm. I think you have a knowledge base that you bring to this and, you know, having this conversation, no matter what, I know I'm going to learn something. I hope that you're able to learn something. And I hope everybody who's out here, uh, who's going to be listening and watching this afterwards. And by the way, if you don't like to watch long form video like this, there's also a podcast that will be made from this. We'll pull the audio and throw it up on all the different platforms where you listen to podcasts. So, uh, Wendy, if you don't mind, we were just having a nice conversation prior to the uh, us going live, and it's funny. I think I meet a lot of people and speak to a lot of people for the first time on this show, and it's people that I've quietly watched on, on LinkedIn and seen a lot of cool stuff that you've posted, and I think we've all supported each other, but I've never had a chance to really speak to you. So if you don't mind, can you tell me and, and everybody who might be listening to this now and in the future a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, yeah, I tend to be a little bit of a LinkedIn stalker too. So I, I watch a, a lot of people and I'm glad that I've crossed paths with you and a bunch of others that I've found on that platform. It's awesome for that purpose. Um, but a little bit about me is I'm involved in quite a few things. Um, I, I currently work full time for the Department of Corrections here in Virginia, and I'm on a new team that we just created last year for employee health and wellness. Um, so I'm getting to pull in a lot of my personal experiences, and some of it is with evidence-based type things, um, into that role and kind of see what works in that field. Um, prior to that, and, and one of my first jobs right out of high school, I was a 911 dispatcher. So I've always kind of been connected with public safety in some way, shape, or form. Um, but about seven years into public safety, um, things had kind of taken a bad turn for me, and I'd experienced a lot of trauma. Um, from that line of work and really needed to find an alternative for me. Um, so I struggled for many years with mental health uh, concerns related to what I had went through in that field and found myself right before COVID taking a peer recovery class. Um, got to take it in person right before COVID hit about two months prior to that. And then really throughout COVID, I thrived. Um, I ended up working on a warm line and learning what that was. Um, I got to get my 500 hours and, and test in the state of Virginia and become fully certified as a peer supporter. Um, and then I loved it so much that I went on to be a trainer. Um, so now I train others for that class. I'm also a certified personal medicine coach with Pat Deegan and Associates, if anyone is familiar with that, um, and also became a trainer for that curriculum. Um, so I've definitely become a 
a teacher and a trainer at heart. Um, it's something that I really love doing. And I teach adjunct for our local community college. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of different balls in the air at, at all different times. I've gotten into doing some podcasts this year and kind of sharing more about those things. And a lot of what has helped me be able to do all of the things that I do now um, and do them so well are the different techniques and things that I've stumbled across in my own recovery journey, uh, many of which are evidence-based and I'm sure we're going to get into talking about a little bit more today. Do you feel differently about disqualifying yourself as an expert after just going through your bio? Yeah. Not really, not really. I, I still think mm -hmm. it's it's so individualized and personalized when we talk about um, recovery, no matter what type of recovery it is. And so I, I feel like I figured out what works for me, but I know it's it's been a long journey trying to figure that out. And so I think I just am able to present options to other people, but I'm not really an expert in what's going to work for them. I would beg to differ. I think that I, that makes you an expert actually is I don't think an expert means that they, you know, everything on a topic and you can help everybody and apply what you know, the information you have within your, between your ears to somebody else's life and immediately make it better. I think it's uh, having that flexibility of mind and knowing different options that people can go down and help guiding people through this. And the fact that you're teaching some of these trainings that you're offering, you're an adjunct professor. I mean, I, I would say that I think you do qualify as somebody who's able to provide a lot of information and knowledge to other people, which is what I believe experts are. Mm -hmm. So, um, I feel different when I get the doctorate eventually, but I, I'm just not feeling it quite yet. I've still got that imposter syndrome, I think, going on a little bit. You know, I relate to that so much. And, you know, I, I'm sitting here kind of helping you qualify as an expert, uh, helping you realize that you are. But I, I would <clears throat> I would never feel comfortable calling myself an expert in anything either. So I, I totally understand. And it's funny. I think I've actually said those words out loud, too, that once my doctorate's finished, uh, maybe then I'll feel like an expert in the topic. But until then, I'm just a learner. Right. And the truth is, I think maybe we all we are all learners and you, we call ourselves an expert when when we're ready, you know, exactly. it doesn't have to be, yeah. there's no qualifications that can make you an expert. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> so you worked for the 911 line and that, that led to a lot of trauma. Um, you began a recovery journey and you said something that was really interesting. And I think a lot of people are scared to say this, um, but it's the truth for millions of people is that you said you thrived during the COVID period. I really did. Um, you know, COVID, I, I think, gave me an opportunity to do things more on my terms and more in my comfort zone because I had just gotten to a point where I had really accepted my mental health diagnosis. I had gotten involved with organizations um, like NAMI and working on that warm line, which was through Mental Health America of Virginia. Um, so I had really learned how to um, to embrace like an online culture and kind of being more by myself at home, but connecting with people through electronic means. And so that's what we had to do during COVID. We were all forced to do that. So it almost kind of like normalized my experience a bit. No, it makes so much sense. And I think a lot of people took a lot of time to learn, to learn about themselves. We were almost forced to, mm -hmm. to look in the mirror. And I think that is also at the same time why we saw so many people's mental health decline is that people found themselves in places that they've been putting off for so long to take a look at their life. And all of a sudden they were forced to and they found themselves not liking what they saw in the mirror. And mm -hmm. although that's a difficult thing to go through, I do think it, it inspired a lot of change and personal growth in a lot of people Oh, at definitely. the same time. Yeah. We, and then we it, all reprioritized what, you know, what, what's, what matters to us and what we want to be in our lives and how do we move forward? Yeah. And even now, like I've gotten so busy and I do a lot of traveling and stuff. Um, I tend to kind of think back to those COVID days where I got to, you know, sleep in and, and kind of work more on my own terms and, and not have all of the traveling and some of the stress that comes with traveling in, in Virginia, particularly Northern Virginia, our traffic is known to be like one of the worst across the U.S. Um, so I find myself kind of craving that simpler lifestyle that I had during COVID. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about this the other day too, that one thing I do miss from the COVID like the uh, shutdown era is the walks just every day going for the walk and 
What's funny though, is that it's, there's some sort of mental block where it's like, well, we're out of that now. So I, I can't take a walk every day. And it's just, you know, again, it, that reminder that the, the simple things that made us happy and those simple things still exist, whether we're in a <laughs> worldwide shutdown mm -hmm. or not. Yeah. Well, and that kind of is a good segue to one of the, the first evidence-based practices I wanted to talk about that's been life-changing for me is mindfulness. Um, one of the first psychiatrists that I saw um, recommended a book to me, and it was um, all about like the mindfulness way. And it was meant to, to really help people who were working through depression, but she found that it was useful for a variety of different diagnoses. Um, and it had like an audio CD that went with it that walked you through um, body scans and like how to take a mindful walk and you listen to this audio as you were taking the walk. Um, there was one that you could listen to like while you were doing the dishes or other stuff around the house. And um, all of these audio recordings just really reframed um, like how you thought about that moment and really like dialed you in to that moment. And at first I thought it was like the silliest thing ever. I was like, I'm not going to be able to get into this mindfulness stuff. Like, this is not me. You know, I had been in that public safety world where there was a lot of stigma, you know, and people just didn't talk about this kind of fluffy mindfulness stuff. So I was very hesitant and resistant to it for a long time. But once I actually tried it and made it part of my routine, um, it was life changing. And to this day, body scans are one of the things that I fall back on. I've been doing them two to three times a week. Um, because I did have anxiety start flaring up when I entered back into public safety in the Department of Corrections this past year. And so I really had to go back and look at all of these tools that I had in my toolbox and say, you know, what can I use? And mindfulness, particularly those body scans, was number one on my list. Wow. Yeah. I always um, I always laugh a little bit with mindfulness because it's people's initial reaction is like, okay, next. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I I'm not doing that. I'm not meditating. I'm not Zen. I'm not, I'm not a monk. And people push that off and they don't realize that how simple of a practice it can be where you don't have to sit cross-legged for 20 minutes and float mm -hmm. above the couch. You can, you can just, like you said, even do dishes. As long as you're present in that moment, um, it has such a profound effect on our, our well-being and our mental health. Even as you started to talk about it, it was a reminder to me and I took, I felt myself taking a deep breath in and slowly letting it out. Mm -hmm. And you know, those breathing exercises that sometimes take a total of two minutes can just bring me back to the moment mm -hmm. and, and make sure that I, okay, I'm here now. Everything is okay. I'm, I'm focused on what's in front of me. So there's there, I know that mindfulness is a, an enormously helpful tool and obviously there's evidence to support it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you work in the Department of Corrections. Is that a tough crowd to try to introduce mindfulness in? Um, very much so. Um, mm. So I, one of the other things I love is guided imagery, which is a, a form of mindfulness where you kind of envision yourself in a place that that you love and you're, you're tapping into the five senses. Um, you know, like, what do you see? What do you feel? Um, what do you smell? So you're, you're really embracing all of those different things and there's lots of different scripts that can walk you through it. Um, and you can make it really short, you can make it really long, um, whatever you kind of need in that moment. So with us in the Department of Corrections, we're really trying to, um, to show staff things that they can incorporate into their day that are really short because a lot of them have really packed days, you know, they're, they're wearing a lot of different hats. Um, so I thought guided imagery, you know, one that was a shorter, maybe two to three minute practice would be good to try with them. And I did try it in one of the probation offices I went through um, for a site visit. And what I saw was some of them were even hesitant to close their eyes. Um, and I guess it's the public safety thing. I can think back to, you know, how public safety changed me. And you're just really hyper aware of everything that's going on around you. Um, your physical safety is, is really important um, because there can be, you know, dangerous things that happen at any given moment. And so I kind of saw a glimpse of that with, you know, people not even being comfortable enough in like a, a conference room in their own office to close their eyes and just try it for a couple of minutes. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely going to be an uphill battle. I'm hopeful that it will get better. Um, you know, it's just we, we have to keep throwing different things at them to kind of see what sticks. And I think I heard somewhere this year that it takes like four times of seeing something or being exposed to it before um, it really like clicks with your your brain to that it's 
something to remember. So, you know, maybe if they see it four or more times, then they'll start getting more comfortable with it. But I think it is going to take time. And I can certainly relate to that because, you know, years ago, there was a time where I wouldn't have been comfortable doing it either. Sure. Yeah. And, there, and there's so many little little nuggets in there that I, I want to dissect, but that you, just I'll, I'll focus on two of them is that one, I think one of the tough sells with something like mindfulness is that it does require a practice and you don't really feel the effects of it or even notice a difference uh, or at least a lasting difference mm -hmm. uh, until you practice it on a regular basis, at least a few times a week. And it doesn't become second nature to you that as stress starts to arise, you take that deep breath and let it out slowly and bring yourself back to the moment. Eventually it becomes second nature to us if you're doing these mindfulness practices, but if you're not used to it, it feels so foreign and it's, you do it for two, three, four times and you're like, this isn't working. I'm not doing this anymore. And it requires some stick to mm -hmm. if you want to, if you want to really reap the benefits of that. The other piece that I thought of with, when you're talking about that is, is sort of the inherent, I don't know if I want to call it trauma, but, but, activation of the central nervous system of working in a type of public safety jobs that, mm -hmm. that you're talking about where it's it is really very important to have some type of outlet mm -hmm. to be able to relax and bring down some the heart rate a little bit there because you are on constant notice and you have to remain vigilant at all times which no one can function like that long term without having some type of negative effect on their mental health no, absolutely not. And and that's what happened to me. I didn't have, you know, any of these tools in place. And several years of all of that building up just got me to that breaking point where I, I had to say, this is not for me anymore. Um, it, it was getting to a point where I was literally burned out. And I knew that I wasn't my best version when I was going to work. And if I wasn't at my best, I couldn't give the public and the people I was serving you know, the best responses that they needed in those moments. They needed somebody who was on their game. So that was a big part of why, you know, I made the decision I did. And then it took me, full disclosure on this, it took me like 10 years um, to really rebuild my life back and um, work through all of this stuff, finally go see a psychiatrist and learn about mm -hmm. mindfulness and learn about all of these techniques. Um, so I'm still kind of in the early stages. When, when I first started getting that kind of help and exploring this stuff, it was 2018. So I'm still in the very early stages and I've done a lot in just a couple of years, but I had a good probably eight to 10 years that were very messy in between there where I did not embrace any of this stuff, evidence-based or not. Um, I was just kind of a, a lone wolf hopping around and um, not doing very well for those years. So I'm glad that I did finally um, find it and, and now that I'm able to use it the way that I am. And when I first started using it, um, you know, I fell asleep during body scans. And of course, the purpose of them is to like, you know, wake up for the day and kind of um, spend that time with yourself. They say like step out of clock time and just kind of um, be in the moment and, and have a nice way to wake up and really sense what's going on in your body. But for the longest time, I fell asleep. And I was like, okay, maybe my body needs sleep. And I at that point, I was so exhausted in my life that I probably did. So it gave me the benefit mm -hmm. I needed then. But as I stuck with it, eventually I stopped falling asleep and started really seeing it for what it was. It's funny because I've always known body scans as the, the help you falling asleep at night. It's, I mean, and I know that you can do them at any point to help re relax and focus you. Mm -hmm. But for me, I've always been taught to use them at night. If your mind's racing and you can't fall asleep, do a body scan and you'll be shocked by the time you get to your head from your toes, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to be falling asleep. And it does. It works. It works every time for me. Yeah, I've now, started. There's a few comments. I, oh, I started using them the opposite way, where I I use them in the mornings if I have time. I do a, a one that's a little bit shorter. It's about a half hour, um, and I'll do it at the beginning of my day, like from seven to seven thirty in the morning before I really jump into work stuff. Yeah, I love that. It's. I don't know. Do, do you wake up with that morning anxiety? Are you Are you one of those people? I know I am. That was what just started happening within this last year when I went back into public safety um, is the anxiety started building more in the morning for me. And prior to that, my triggers had always come at night. And so if I could get 
to sleep at night, I was good. Um, but that's why I really had to rethink within just this past year, um, you know, how can I switch up my schedule and what can I do differently? And so that's something I do in the mornings as something different. I love that. Uh, there's a few comments for anybody who's watching this live or able to comment through to us in real time. And uh, Reb, I want to say hi. Reb's always, he's always popping on here. And he says, hello, Blake. Hello, Wendy. And Sebastian's on here who has written a bunch of comments and there's, they're worth really going back to read. But there's one that I want to, I do want to highlight is that funny enough, a few minutes ago, I was very angry. I practiced a bit of mindfulness process and although still, ugh, I am in more control of how I react to what is before me. And I, I love that. I mean, and this is exactly what we're talking about is that it, it brings us back to the present moment and it gives us that ability. I, I firmly believe that having a regular mindfulness practice gives us an ability to decide how we're going to, to respond instead of mm -hmm. react to, it, to a, a type of stimulus. Yes, it, it can be very proactive instead of reactive, um, which I think is what a lot of different types of treatment options or, or even other like grounding techniques, some of them tend to be that more reactive. Um, but a health coach actually shared with me um, this year how I could start using some of these things on a more regular basis, um, even yoga, because I was having trouble like getting in a, a regular routine with yoga. I would only use it when I was starting to feel really bad. And she's like, well, you know, they're more effective if you actually use them all of the time. Um, and that way your body kind of builds up to it instead of just yeah. using them when it feels like you're you know, kind of going downhill again. So that's I made this whole self-care menu thing for myself of the, what are the practices I need to be doing daily? What are the ones I need to do weekly? Um, what are things I need to do monthly? And then what are like extras that I can incorporate in? And so the mindfulness is something I try to do two to three times a week, um, particularly the body scans. Yoga, I try to do at least once a week. Um, and then a, a funny thing with yoga, there's this type of yoga called laughter yoga. And I don't know if um, anyone that's watching is familiar with it, but it's actually hilarious to do. And like you make yourself laugh. You go through this sequence of like, hee hee, ha ha, ho ho. And like you keep doing it. And it's so silly. And it kind of like reverts back to childhood, you know, like when we laughed all the time. And then as adults, yeah. we don't. Um, but forcing yourself through that practice and kind of making your body do that again, it fires those happy chemicals like the dopamine and stuff that the body needs. And it really just changes, like you were talking about, the way you react to stuff. Um, so it kind of takes all the seriousness out of things. So just going through that little sequence a couple of times can wow. be super helpful. Yeah, I'm not sure I would do it like in an office, you know, um, if there were other coworkers around me or I wasn't like in a private space, but I do it when I work on the days I work from home quite a bit. And I've even got my husband who also has a connection to public safety and tends to be a little more serious all the time. I've got him embracing it and doing it. And I mean, he started doing it because he was kind of mocking it and he thought it was silly. Um, but now it really does help him and he'll do it. And we play with our dogs. The dogs look at us all crazy because, you know, they they think that we've lost our minds walking around the house doing this. But it actually it, it's brought our family together. It's just made us have that that level of connection. That's also great about yoga. I feel like that is one that honestly takes some bravery and kind of having to put our egos completely aside to just be uh -huh. willing to look silly, be silly and just laugh. I mean, I totally make sense. They always say laughter is the best medicine. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. So. Um, Love mindfulness, and I love that that you're introducing that in the Department of Corrections. And before we move on, I just am curious. You mentioned you travel a lot, so is this something that you said you you live in Virginia and you work in Virginia in the Department of Corrections? Mm -hmm. Are you bringing these concepts of trying to create an employee wellness? What, what did you call it? I'm sorry, you're bringing um, it's an employee health and wellness team employee health and wellness team. So are you bringing this to different areas all around the country? Oh, absolutely not. Um, so when I say I <laughs> travel a lot, um, I cover the entire central area of Virginia. We basically, our team is small. We divided it into three sections, Eastern, Central, and Western. And so I'm the coordinator for all of the central region. So I go from like Alexandria and Arlington at the very tip top of Virginia near DC, 
um, all the way down to the North Carolina border. So my my entire region is, you know, about four or five hours travel, depending on where you're located at in it. Um, and I'm required to visit all of our institutions and all of our probation offices in that area every quarter. So every three months. Um, so I spend two to three days of my week on the road going out to those sites and connecting with employees in person, um, kind of meeting them where they are. And then I spend the other days working from home on administrative type tasks um, and trying out different things like this, you know, that I can incorporate into our programs. Um, different, you know, types of topics that we can send out. We do like a weekly email to them and we try to keep everything, you know, super short um, things that they can just really incorporate when they have a couple minutes here and there between breaks or are on the way in the door, on the way out the door, those kind of things. Um, so, short but effective. It's, yeah, it's really short cool. but effective. That's definitely the key. Um, so all of the stuff that I've tried personally, it just kind of gives me a little bit more um I guess, way of connecting and, and trying to to get it out there to them, because I can say I've had personal experience with using it. And sometimes it's more effective and people connect with that idea versus like, well, I've never tried this, but you should kind of. Technique. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually one of the thoughts I was having earlier, too, is that it's it's really cool that you're practicing what you preach. So you're, you're coming in there, not just speaking from book knowledge, but understanding uh, the personally the effects of, of all of these tools. Mm -hmm. and, but you're also presenting them the data and why it's important and why it's evidence-based. What, what would be another form of evidence-based support? Um, so I have like a whole list of them because there's so many that I've done. I was afraid I was going to forget some. Um, That's cool. So I also do tapping. Um, tapping is another one of those kind of silly things. Um, there's a really cool app that goes along with it called the Tapping Solutions. And that's how I basically started with it because the app walks you through like the whole sequence. Um, but you kind of set up like a statement um, of what you want to work through. And then you have certain points on the body that you tap and you acknowledge that statement. And then like you kind of acknowledge that it's OK to feel the way you feel in that moment. Um, and then you kind of set it up so that you are accepting it and OK with kind of whatever happens with it happens kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't do the tapping a lot of times unless I have that, that app going to kind of walk me, um, through it because I don't like to say the stuff out loud. I just like to listen to the person in the app, mm -hmm. but some people like to actually create their own scripts and, and really get into it that way so that it's more, um, personalized to them. But the one I use out of the app is also centered around anxiety. Um, and you rate the intensity of it when you start the practice. And then it, the app asks you to come back at the end and rate your inten um, intensity. That way you can see how much it changed. So that's kind of a okay. cool to do. Um, I've seen, um, I, you know, it's funny. I've heard of tapping and I'm working in mental health and, and substance use disorder treatment for so long. I've, I've seen and heard of the tapping technique, but I've never mm -hmm. heard anybody really explain what it is. And the other day, maybe two, three weeks ago, I was watching an interview that Pink the musician was doing. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of her talking, she just started doing that and then hitting here. Uh -huh. And, but just kept talking through it. And I was like, I think that's the tapping thing that she's doing. So she must practice it. And it was, maybe she was getting triggered by something during the interview and just was calming herself down. But yeah. um, for whatever reason, it, it's just, it seems to be coming up recently. So it's really interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen that interview, but I, I do follow a lot of the stuff that she does. Um, even in one of my recent peer recovery classes that I taught, one of the students was really into her music and had used her music as like an inspiration throughout her own journey. Um, so I kind of reconnected with uh, my teenage years and went back to listening to some of her older stuff because music is also like a, a good thing. I don't know that there's really evidence-based um, data behind it, but it's certainly very helpful for mental for my mental health. I use it all the time just to kind of get me in a good space. Um, there actually is evidence there's a and i only know this because i used to work for a, a program that was music based centered they treated substance use disorders and mental health concerns mm -hmm. uh, with music at the core of everything at their approach they had a very creative uh, curriculum but they did it based on information and data that they researched using music and the power of music being able to calm us down to bring us back in time to help recall certain memories um, to help motivate us 
there's, and there's also a lot of motivational speakers and people like Tony Robbins actually uses music throughout his entire seminars to help keep people engaged, to get them into almost like a trance like state, to get mm. them excited, to get to, it's really, it's fascinating, but music is such a powerful tool for everybody to use. And it really hits that reset. Think about all the times that we've been in a car or we're angry, we get into our car and put on some music we like. And by the end of our drive, we're feeling incredible. Yes, you know, definitely. It has a, a very powerful ability to to reset our mind states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something I share with, with some of our staff too. A lot of them have commutes that are at least like a half hour, if not longer, depending on what part of the state they're in. And I'm like, you know, use that commute as your like on and off switch, you know, your time to decompress. Um, so, so that you have some work-life balance and you're not taking the work home with you. Um, so right. I, I think that that's a really easy way of incorporating it and then using the music along with that commute. And you can do some of the um, the breathing techniques you were mentioning earlier too. I know some people that do different deep breathing techniques when they're stuck in traffic. Um, there's one called Lion's Breath that a friend recently shared with me that she does. And I would love to see her do this in traffic because it's another one of those kind of silly thing yeah. like you pop out the hands and you stick out your tongue and kind of like roar and i'm like if you do that in traffic i'm sure people are just going to be parting the ways and letting you go on through <laughs> i i uh done that in yoga the and it's it is one of those ones that borderline feels embarrassing you have to just kind of <laughs> look at yourself in the mirror not look at anybody else and just be like i'm not i'm not looking around the room to see who's watching me mm -hmm. and it's definitely one but it works you know it's a big release there's no question Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cause, um, I did it so much like the, the first day that they were telling me about it, that I definitely felt a huge difference in, you know, cause I'm usually very tense and everything. And I, by the end of the day, I was just walking around, like, I'm not tense at all. Like I could go to sleep at any moment. Um, apparently I got all the bad stuff out. Um, but it's, it's also one of those moves that you shouldn't do, I guess, too close to bedtime because it, it also energizes you or it's meant to energize you. So it's recommended to do that one earlier in the morning. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So of all the different evidence-based supports that you offer, I imagine that you do receive feedback from the different, the people that you're introducing these ideas to. Is there any particular one that you get a lot of feedback on that has had a positive, like what's the one that's the most well-received? Huh. You know, our, our team at DOC is, is so new that we're, we're getting feedback, but I, I don't know that I've gotten enough feedback on any of the ones we've talked about in particular, except maybe the yoga, because um, our, our team lead, she is also a yoga instructor. Um, so she has she's created um, like a sequence of chair yoga because many of our positions, they are, you know, setting a lot of the times at post um, or, you know, with those commutes that they've got. Um, so the, the chair yoga has, has been really well received. Um, and she does that live twice a month and then can also go out to sites and do it, um, you know, more kind of impromptu for just their, their groups if they want it that way instead of virtually. Um, so that one's probably so far had the most feedback, but that's more of her thing that she does. I, I always say I'm a better person to do yoga than instruct it. And I'm certainly not, not certified in that means. Um, so but then out of the stuff that I'm familiar with and that I've, you know, shared with people through other avenues that I like with teaching the, the peer recovery class and stuff, um, I get a lot of really good feedback on one we haven't talked about so much yet. And that's um, the wrap and wrap for work plans. So wrap okay. is a wellness recovery action plan. And then there's different ones that you can utilize for um, there's one specific for work. And um, there's some other like specialized ones that you can do for different areas. And I'll be learning more about it actually later this month. I'm going to um, start taking the steps to become what they call a RAP facilitator as well, um, where I can teach okay. that to other people. But um, it, it's kind of like a plan that you create when you're feeling really well and you're in control and you get to, you know, write out like when I'm feeling good, this is how I feel when I'm not feeling so well, or I notice things are starting to kind of go downhill, these are the, the things you might see me doing. Um, and then you can also specify, and especially for the workplace, it's important, um, who you want to be involved, should you not be feeling well, or you have a crisis in the workplace. 
So you can say, I want, you know, this coworker involved. I want this, this person involved or call my husband or call this particular doctor, therapist, mm. whatever it is. Um, you write all of this stuff out. So it's a very preventative type plan. Um, and I, that's what I love about it because when I have those moments where I start sliding downhill or start going in a crisis, there's a lot of people I don't trust. I still have a very small, you know, circle yeah. that, that is really close to me that I want to help. Um, so my number one is call my counselor, call my husband. Like those are the two things that I put And Occasionally there might be one coworker that I'm comfortable with, um, in my new role, I, I'm still kind of getting to know people. I've only been in that role about eight months. So I don't really have anyone there yet um, that I feel like I could put on that plan. Um, so it, it's important that I have that. And then you share it with just who you feel needs to know it or needs to have that information. So you might only share it with one coworker or maybe a supervisor. It doesn't always have to be your supervisor, but just whoever would need to have that information in that moment to be able to help you the best. That makes so much sense. I mean, it's, it's almost like having an emergency contact form and, or like wearing those, those, you know, like the necklaces or bracelets that talk about like a medical condition that you have mm -hmm. when it relates to our mental health. It's a lot harder to do that, but having somebody knowing someone's having some type of anxiety attack or um, really struggling or trauma response mm -hmm. to something that's going on at work, and having someone that knows the information about them and is able to actually act in the moment in an appropriate way, instead of trying to tell you to calm down or mm -hmm. go take a break, go for a walk, you know, none of those things could be very helpful in the moment. You might need just a quick phone call to somebody who's your trusted support right. to help talk you down. So that's really interesting. Yeah. And I mean, you can put I, you know, those other actions, like if, if going for a walk or, you know, taking like a 10 minute break, maybe going, um, to sit in your car for 10 or 15 minutes by yourself, you know, whatever it is that um, you figured out you need for you, that's what you can put in that. Yeah. Plan. And also um, I always like to talk about the like response piece of it. If it gets bad enough that you would need like an intervention or, or some type of emergency response, that plan has a section in it where you can say like, um, I want 911 called, or I don't want 911 called, or I don't want to go to this ER. I'd rather be taken to this treatment facility. Like you can specify right. all of that out because even, you know, coming from the 911 field, I know that 911 is not always a safe option for everyone. You know, there's right. a lot of, of trauma and different things. And, you know, some agencies still put you in handcuffs. Um, you know, they have the different types mm -hmm. of holds and things like that at hospitals, sometimes that can be backed up and it can be very lengthy. In our area, we're pretty small and rural that you could be sitting at a hospital if that's the path that someone chose to, to take you down, you could be sitting at that hospital for a day or so before you get moved to a treatment facility. So if, if you have a better alternative and option that you want utilized that works best for you, um, then that's the place on that plan to, to kind of spell that out and that way it saves everyone the trouble um and you know not having to go through anything that's gonna traumatize or re-traumatize anyone more I, I mean the more that we were talking about this the more i'm feeling like this is something that should be part of every hr paperwork that everybody does as a new hire mm -hmm. and then maybe revisit it every year as well so the person can update in case things have changed throughout the year or they've built a different trusted supports but this sounds like something that every organization should be using to help support somebody's wellness and mental health as an employee and doing it in the way that speaks to them. Right. I mean, a lot of places have you fill out. And I, th I think I even did one for the department I'm at now, like an emergency contact form. But it's just very right. you know, basic. Um, I think I, I only had to put down my husband and maybe one other relative that, you know, if something medically ever happened. Those would be the two people to contact. It, it might have asked for my doctor's name. I'm not sure, but it, it wasn't very in depth um, no. compared to these other plans. And and these other plans, you know, they're not super lengthy. The the wrap for work is um, a total of maybe 12 to 15 pages. It's been a while since I've glanced at it. I really need to update my own. Um, but it's it's not super lengthy. It just takes a little bit of time, you know, to sit down and really think through those things and, and make sure that you write everything out the way that you you want it set up. Um, and then if you're 
you know, in the habit of updating it every year or every time maybe you, you change jobs. Um, it's not like you're going to have to rebuild the entire plan. You just might have to plug in one or two things that are, you know, specific or need to be updated. But once you get that initial right. and done, it's going to be easier from that point. Uh, it totally makes sense. Um, I mean, even maybe finding a way to shorten it so somebody doesn't feel overwhelmed by having to even fill that out. Mm -hmm. But so finding some some form of a wrap plan um, or wrap sheet, that sounds bad. Um, <laughs> like It sounds like you've been arrested. Uh, but some type of form that you could fill out that allows people to understand you and understand any struggles that you may have and openly speak about them and how to address them pro appropriately just sounds almost like common sense when you start thinking about employee wellness. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in this funny, and it's gonna be a while, this transitionary period of how employees are looked at in workplaces and mm -hmm. going back to, circling back to the beginning of our conversation about uh, shining in the COVID era. Um, I think that it obviously shed a lot of light on ways that we, work as as organizations and ways that we operate in areas that were failing our employees and for a little while there was this giant workplace wellness movement and then it's sort of as we came out of COVID and the the market started crashing all that it seems to be pushed being pushed to the wayside a little bit um, although i'm starting to see it come back now as things are stabilizing and we have to reevaluate a lot of the things that hr for example or a lot of different ways that we're approaching employees and I think we need to start looking at the HR process, not as just something that we do as for liability reasons and that we mm -hmm. just have to say that we've done, but we're looking at it as something that can actually benefit our employees and bring value to them in times of struggle mm -hmm. or Absolutely. times of success. I mean, regardless. Yeah. Cause I mean, you want people to be doing well and really embracing where they're at and, and want to stay where they're at. And that's another huge issue with, you know, HR is that retention piece. Um, and something that, that we've been using in a lot of our trainings too, that I think it kind of came out of COVID um, and is getting a lot more ground now is that Surgeon General's framework for mental health and well-being. So if mm -hmm. you haven't seen that framework, it's got the five different areas um, that are important in the workplace these days. It's protection from harm, community and connection, um, work-life harmony, instead of saying like work-life balance, they call it work-life harmony, um, mattering at work, you know, feeling like you're really making a difference and that people want you to be there. And then also having opportunities for growth. So not feeling like, you know, you're stuck in an entry level position or that you've like reached your potential and as far as you're going to go there, but always having opportunities to learn and to grow both personally and professionally has really become important to people. And that one's huge for me too. Like I, I do a lot of professional development. I've talked about a lot of these things that I've gotten trainings in this year that I've become a, a trainer or a facilitator for. Um, and, you know, I know it's a tough budget year and things, but sadly I've paid for a lot of those out of my pocket or gotten scholarships for them. Um, and I really think that organizations need to start looking at their budgets a little bit, even though they're tight, you know, and, and mm -hmm. figuring out ways to a lot more money to that and investing in the employees that they have. Um, because I think that's going to go a long way in retaining people. I totally agree. And I think actually in that, that document, which I've had open on my computer forever, ever since, <laughs> ever since it came out and something I referenced quite often, I believe that he even mentioned some of the benefits of investing in this approach and talks about how it's there's research has shown that there's a 4x return on investment in investing in your employees health and wellness so it's it makes so much sense even during hard times it's really time where you double down to help make sure that your employees are taken care of because you're gonna when things start to get better you're gonna receive so much back from that investment mm -hmm. Um, Sebastian said, could you spell out the abbreviation and full term again, please, regarding the uh, RAP plan? RAP. Um, so it's RAP, W-R-A-P, and it's the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Awesome. And if you Google that, you, you should be able to, to find the website. Um, sometimes stuff from what they call the Copeland Center comes up because some of the trainings are connected through that. So if you see it, connected there. That's the same thing. That's what I was talking about. Awesome. 
Well, we're coming towards the end here. and you, You've shed some light on some uh, three or four really great practices that are, again, it always is surprising to me, maybe yet not surprising at the same time, of how simple a lot of these practices are for people to do. Um, yet it's so often not introduced in the workplace and it's so often ignored. And I mean, even I'm guilty of it myself with meditation or mindfulness. Um, I go off and on with it. And I think these all these things are so easy to to implement in our own lives and have such profound effects on our own wellness. And I it just constantly is a reminder to me that as employers, it's our duty to make sure that our employees are following through and we're giving them space and time to be able to follow through on these practices and that mm -hmm. we're checking in with them and we're seeing how it's going and we're we're not just teaching them about it but we're also helping them see um, that you we're giving them space time for it and that we're pushing them to do these things so that they can better take care of themselves and mm -hmm. ultimately be happier employees and more productive and more present and prevent future mental health concerns mm -hmm. and all of the good stuff that comes along with it yeah but before you say anything because i want to highlight this real quick you mentioned to me before we started that you were recently given at this year's NamiCon the lionel eldridge award i believe it was called right yeah i always i always screw it up so i have to look at it um okay. it's the lionel aldridge champions award Aldridge. yes so i was going to ask you prior to us starting but i want to ask you on here what how did this honor come about? Um, so ironically enough, I self-nominated myself. Um, I had recently gotten an award here in Virginia from our Disability Law Center as a um, what they called an impact award winner for the year for the work that I've done um, as a peer recovery specialist trainer and particularly trying to get um, those trainings and trying to give back to public safety because I would really mm -hmm. love to get that type of training out to public safety as well. Um, but it's really hard to, to advocate and to get into certain corners with that. But I've done a lot of work, um, a lot of presentations, some podcasts, you know, lots of different things to try to get um, the word out and, you know, just the advocacy need out for more of those trainings and, and for peer support in general, because it was such a big turning point for me. Um, so that's what the award I got from the Disability Law Center was about. And so then I saw the the open call for um, for nominations for the, the NAMI awards. And when I was reading down through the descriptions of what different ones were, um, this particular one had to do a lot with peer support as well. It's like the highest peer um, recognition award that NAMI gives out. And um, so on the actual um, award that they gave me, it says for her courage, leadership, and service on behalf of people living with mental illness, mental health conditions, and the advocacy work that I do in that field. So that's that's what it's all about. I love that. And I love, 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 love that you nominated yourself. And I think that not enough people do that. And you do deserve that award. You are working very hard to try to make changes and, and to really advocate for, for your peers and people who have gone through similar situations uh, mm -hmm. that you have. And I, I know I appreciate it that you're putting in all this effort. Um, I know it's not easy. And NAMI is a very special organization to me. And I, I, I love that you were able to be honored by them and mm -hmm. for this very reason. So congrats and kudos to you on every Thank piece you. of that. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll, I'll tell people this kind of mantra that I live by because um, we were talking about imposter syndrome before we went live. And I definitely have a lot of that going on. Sometimes I don't feel like I belong in the spaces that I'm in or, or that I'm just like not worthy of being there yet. That's the whole thing behind imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, but I also have this mantra of like, trying to get invited to different tables. Um, and if I'm not invited to a table, I bring a folding chair. So <laughs> that's, that's kind <laughs> of the, the way that I think about it with you know, nominating myself and things, because yeah, um, not everybody knows everything that I have going on. You know, I'm a pretty private person for the most part. So I don't like publicly announce, you know, all of the work that I'm doing. Um, but when I look at it collectively, like I see the impact. And so, you know, I knew what kind of impact it had and I wanted to kind of put it out there, I had no idea that I was going to win. You know, of course, when you self-nominate, you're just like, oh, I'm just, you know, kind of pitching it. It's, nothing's ever going to happen with it. But, yeah. you know, I, 
I did. I, I did win. So obviously someone else saw that same thing there. Um, and that really makes yeah. a huge difference for other people to see it and believe in you on that level. No, it's just so cool. And I, I mean, I love that story. And I love the fact that, that you did get selected and you did win. It's just, it's amazing. And as somebody else who struggles with imposter syndrome, I totally get it. And I think, I think most high achievers and people seeking growth have some form of imposter syndrome. And I'm, I think I'm, I'm willing to argue that I think imposter syndrome to an extent is healthy because it does keep us growing mm -hmm. and it keeps us curious and never lets us settle and rest on our laurels and, and what we currently know. Um, at the same time, it could be detrimental if it makes us freeze up and we don't do anything with it because right. of it. Yeah. So I love that your approach to it is like, yeah, I don't feel like I belong here. I want to be at the table though. So I'm going to bring a chair myself and I'm just going to show up and see what happens. Right. And, and it works, um, you know, and it, it's provided me the opportunity to have some really cool experiences. Um, like without getting this award, I would have never gotten on a plane. I had at, at my age, I had never been on a plane ride before. Um, so when they notified me that I no had way. won, yeah, that I was like, OK, well, you know, it's a 17 hour drive. I don't think I can drive 17 <laughs> hours and have to take off work and all of that stuff. Um, but then I, I looked at plane rides and I was like, oh, it's only two and a half hours by plane. I guess I'm finally biting the bullet and getting on a plane. Um, so I did. And I, I had a really you know good experience and being able um, to navigate airports and, you know, that whole process for the first time, in addition to going and, and getting the recognition was just as important to me because it pushed me to do something that I had been afraid of for so many years. And so now wow. I'm not I'm not afraid of that anymore. And I can start with my conference presentations that I do. I try to do two or three of those a year. Um, I can start pitching to ones that are outside of Virginia and, you know, a little bit farther yeah. out because now I'm OK getting on a plane to go do them. So it, it all so kind cool. of, you know, prepares me for other things in life. And, and that's what I love about it. I love that it keeps pushing me as a person to grow more. What was that takeoff like for the first time on the plane? You know, it wasn't as bad. I, I don't know what I was so afraid of or what I was expecting, but it really wasn't that bad. You know, I talked about I, I live in a pretty rural area and I've been in some bumpy truck rides, you know, and some pretty rough rides around here. And yeah. that plane ride was smoother than some of those. Um, probably the worst thing for me was landing just because, you know, you have that long stretch down the runway and you're kind of bracing yourself till it gets stopped. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a, it was a beautiful day. We didn't have any turbulence or anything. So it, it was just a really wonderful experience. That's awesome. What airline I have to ask? Southwest. Okay. So yeah, great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And if you're going to say like frontier or spirit, I mean, like, trust me, it actually gets better on other airlines as well. Yeah, no, Southwest has the no assigned seating thing too. So I was really nervous, you know, sitting beside strangers. Um, but I had an older couple who, you know, one of them wanted the window seat and one wanted the aisle seat. And since I was traveling alone, they're like, oh, would you like to sit with us? Um, so, you know, I sat in the in between them and they kind of, you know, gave me some tips, you know, chew gum, you know, swallow a couple of times as we're going up to help with the altitude. And um, yeah, yeah. It, was just, it was really nice. I couldn't have asked cool. for a better experience. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I love that. Um, I love that you now have brought into your horizons of where you can speak and this everything that we've talked about on this, uh, this hour long uh, Zoom live podcast, all of the above show episode, whatever we want to call it. Um, it was honestly a real pleasure. It was a pleasure to get to know you more and, and the work that you're doing. And I believe you deserve those honors. And I'm, I'm excited to see where you're going to be in a year from now, five years. 10 years from now, I know that you're going to keep doing incredible things and make a real difference in, in this world. So I, I, I appreciate you very much and I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I, I've been trying to, to get out there more and, and podcasts seem to be the thing these days. So when I saw yours, I was like, oh, this, this would be cool to do. Um, so yeah, I always, always love the opportunity to, to talk to a different audience, you know, on a different platform and things. Um, cause you never know, like you said, what it, what it could bring. And, and I have no idea what to expect in the next year, five years, 10 years, because even if you would have asked me in the middle of COVID, you know, just a couple of years ago where I would be, I never would have imagined that I would be doing the things I'm doing now. And in some of the spaces right. I am, so life has that funny way of surprising you. Right. 
I think that is the the hidden beauty in every recovery journey is that it brings us to places that we never thought mm -hmm. we never would have thought of beyond our wildest dreams, but beyond that, things and areas, places that we've never thought that would be we'd be working within, and how much uh, gratitude come from those moments of mm -hmm. realizing like how did I get here? This is incredible, and I love what I'm doing today. Yeah. So it's. I, you got to thank the recovery journey for that, because I know at least my recovery journey has brought me to mm -hmm. places that I never thought were going to be possible. Yeah, I, I would not be the same person without it, for sure. For sure. Same here. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Like I've said, if you miss this, it's going to live on my LinkedIn, I guess, for the rest of time, as long as LinkedIn still is in business. And then it's also going to be available in a couple of weeks as a podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. The podcast is called The Workplace Wonder Lessons from Experts, just like Wendy, who is an expert. And uh, I really appreciate everybody who's been tuning in. I'm seeing each week the listens on the podcast go up. So thank you, everybody who's been checking this out. And, and again, Wendy, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you. No worries. Bye, everyone. <laughs>